Today on the Feast of Divine Mercy, let's start with a little review. Why does the Church erect new feasts over the course of time? In 1925, on the occasion of erecting a new feast, the Feast of Christ the King, Pope Pius XI explained just that. Pius XI. These festivals have been instituted one after another according as the needs or advantage of the people of Christ seem to demand, as when they needed strength to face a common danger, when they were attacked by insidious heresies, when they needed to be urged to the pious consideration of some mystery of faith or of some divine blessing. For example, when reverence and devotion to the Blessed Sacrament had grown cold, the Feast of Corpus Christi was instituted so that by means of psalm procession and prayers of eight days' duration, men might be brought once more to render public homage to Christ. So, too, the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was instituted at a time when men were oppressed by the sad and gloomy severity of Jansenism, which made their hearts grow cold and shut them out from love of God and the hope of salvation. Close quote the Vicar of Christ. Okay, so over time... Feasts have been instituted according to the needs of the faithful. Today's feast is no exception to that. In fact, in the course of his appearances to St. Faustina, our Lord made it very clear why he wished this feast to be established. And as was the case with the Feast of the Sacred Heart, he also specified the precise day on which he wished this feast to be celebrated. Let's take a brief look at the history behind today's feast before we consider the messages of our Lord. St. Faustina was born to a poor family in Poland in 1905. She had three years of formal schooling. In the summer of 1924, St. Faustina, her sister, went to a dance. At the dance, she suddenly had a vision of our Lord suffering. Obviously, she didn't feel like dancing after that anymore, so she left the dance, went into the church, where she was told by our Lord to leave for Warsaw immediately and join a convent. That night, she packed a small bag, and in the morning, without the permission of her parents, she took a train for Warsaw, 130 miles away, even though she knew absolutely no one there. When she arrived in Warsaw, she entered into the first church she saw and asked the priest what she ought to do. He recommended that she stay with a lady that was known to him until she could find a convent. She was refused entry by a number of convents until finally the sisters of Our Lady of Mercy decided to give her a chance. After entering, she was given the humblest task in the convent, usually cooking, cleaning, or gardening. Then on February 22, 1931, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ appeared to St. Faustina. She describes the scene, quote, In the evening, when I was in my cell, I became aware of the Lord Jesus clothed in a white garment. One hand was raised in blessing, The other was touching the garment at the breast. From the opening of the garment at the breast, there came forth two large rays, one red and the other pale. In silence, I gazed intently at the Lord. My soul was overwhelmed with fear, but also with great joy. After a while, Jesus said to me, Paint an image according to the pattern you see with the inscription, Jesus, I trust in you. Sometime later, our Lord again spoke to her. The pale ray stands for the water, which makes souls righteous. The red ray stands for the blood, which is the life of souls. These two rays issued forth from the depths of my most tender mercy at that time when my agonizing heart was opened by a lance on the cross. St. Faustina recorded the message from our Lord in notebooks, which are now known as the Diary of St. Maria Faustina Kowalska. In her diary... St. Faustina predicted her work would be suppressed for some time and then accepted again. She died in 1938. Two decades later, the Divine Mercy Devotion was indeed banned by the Vatican. Okay, Father, why was the Divine Mercy Devotion banned and why did the ban get lifted? In April 1978, the Prefect of the Sacred Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith explained that the ban was a result of misunderstandings that were based on a faulty Italian translation of her diary. Now that they had the accurate translation, they lift the ban. What is the significance of having the feast on the first Sunday after Easter? You can see the significance relating to the epistle if you read it. But anyway, if you look in your missiles, you can see this Sunday is traditionally called Dominican Albus, which means the, the Sunday in white. Because in the times of the fathers, there were massive numbers of converts that had been baptized at the Easter vigil. And then for the first week, 
up till this day. For the first week, they wore these white baptismal gowns. And, uh, and then this Sunday was the first time they'd be with the, the rest of the faithful and indistinguishable. In his sermon for this very Sunday on the liturgical calendar, the great father and doctor of the church, St. Augustine, called the whole octave from Easter until today, quote, the days of mercy and pardon, close quote. And all you have to do is just think of our ancestors, except for the Hebrew Catholics here. All our ancestors had been freed on the Easter vigil from their paganism, and then they'd been washed clean from all their sins. And St. Augustine called today, this very Sunday, quote, the compendium of the days of mercy, close quote, St. Augustine. Okay, so why in this day and age would Christ the Lord emphasize the doctrine of divine mercy? Our Lord spoke to St. Faustine about this precise question. I'll quote from her diary. Before the day of justice, I'm sending the day of mercy. Tell souls about this great mercy of mine, because the awful day, the day of my justice, is near. You will prepare the world for my final coming. Speak to the world about my mercy. It is a sign for the end times. After it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the fountain of my mercy. I am prolonging the time of mercy for the sake of sinners, but woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. He who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. Close quotes our Lord. Our Lady also spoke to St. Faustina about this, and I quote, Oh, how pleasing to God is the soul that follows faithfully the inspirations of his grace. I gave the Savior to the world. As for you, you have to speak to the world about his great mercy and prepare the world for a second coming of him who will come not as a merciful Savior, but as a just judge. Oh, how terrible is that day. Determined is the day of justice, the day of divine wrath. The angels tremble before it. Speak to souls about this great mercy while it is still the time for granting mercy. If you keep silent now, you'll be answering for a great number of souls on that terrible day. Okay, so as we've seen, the church institutes new feasts according to the needs of the faithful. We've been considering the question, why in this day and age would Christ our Lord emphasize the doctrine of divine mercy? And the answer is to remind us of and prepare us for that terrible day, day of anger and wrath when he's going to come in the clouds of glory with his angels to judge the living and the dead. The world is grinding to an end, and we don't want to be caught out, rounded out, rounded up with the goats. This is the time for mercy. Now let's take a few minutes to review the particular graces attached to the feast itself. Our Lord told St. Faustina, quote, My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the feast of mercy be a refuge and a shelter for all souls, and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the font of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which grace flow are opened. Let no soul fear to draw near to me, even though its sins be as scarlet. My mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or of angel, will be able to fathom it through all eternity. The feast of mercy has emerged from my merry depths of tenderness. It is my desire that it be solemnly celebrated on the first Sunday after Easter. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the font of my mercy. A 500-page analysis, the most in-depth analysis written to date of the graces of the Feast of Divine Mercy was done by Father Ignacy Rosicki, STD, a Polish Thomistic theologian. He did it as part of the official investigation into St. Faustina's life and virtues by the Congregation for the Cause of Saints. Father Rosicki, quote, In this matter, four points are beyond all doubt. A. The special grace was promised in the context of the Feast of Mercy. B. 
It was directly attached to receiving Holy Communion on this day. C. It consists in the total remission of sins and punishment. D. It is theologically possible. Close quote. In a 1981 symposium, Father Zeke commented, quote, The most exceptional grace promised by Jesus for the Feast of the Divine Mercy is something considerably greater than a plenary indulgence. The latter consists only of the remission of temporal punishments for committed sins, but is never the remission of sins itself. The exceptional grace of the communion on Divine Mercy Sunday is also greater than the graces of the other sacraments, with the exception of the sacrament of baptism. For the remission of all sins and punishment is found only in the sacramental grace of baptism. In the promises cited, Christ tied the remission of all sins and punishment to the reception of Holy Communion on the Feast of Divine Mercy. In other words, in this regard, he raised it to the rank of a second baptism. It is obvious that in order to effect a complete forgiveness of sins and punishment, the Holy Communion received on the Feast of Divine Mercy must not only be partaken of worthily, but it must also fulfill the basic requirements of the Divine Mercy devotion. Received unworthily, without trust in Divine Mercy, and devoid of some deed of mercy toward neighbor, it would be a contradiction of devotion to Divine Mercy. Instead of exceptional grace, it would bring down upon the recipient the Divine Wrath. Close quote. Okay, so the special grace granted on the Feast of Divine Mercy is directly attached to receiving Holy Communion on this day. It consists in the total remission of sins and punishment. It's considerably greater than plenary indulgence. It's a lot easier to gain. Father Ezekiel makes another important point. Quote, Our Lord insists that one receive Holy Communion worthily on the day of the feast itself. By this requirement, he incorporates the devotion into the sacramental life of the Church because the end of the ordinary per- period for making Easter Communion falls on that Sunday. Close quote. Now, in America, the bishops have extended the time for making your Easter duty to Trinity Sunday, because remember, we all have to go to communion once a year during the Easter season. And it's extended to Trinity Sunday, but you can see why our Lord would have divine mercy on this, because this would be the end of the ordinary time right today. Okay, so what about confession? Does that have to be made on the Feast of Divine Mercy? Certainly before one goes to communion, if he has mortal sin on his soul. But that would be the only case. As one commentator notes, quote, Christ never specifically asked for the faithful to go to confession on the day of the feast itself, which, practically speaking, would be an impossible burden on most pastors. In fact, St. Faustina herself made her confession on the Saturday before Mercy Sunday. Whenever times a confession may be offered, the important thing is for the faithful to be encouraged to come to Mercy Sunday in a state of grace, having confessed at least all mortal sins, and trusting in the mercy of God. Close quote. Is there anything else we ought to do? Yes. Our Lord said to St. Faustina, quote, The first Sunday after Easter is the Feast of Mercy, but there must also be acts of mercy. I demand from you deeds of mercy, which ought to arise out of love for me. You are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or try to excuse or absolve yourself from it. I am giving you three ways of exercising mercy toward your neighbor. The first, by deed the second by word, the third by prayer. In these three degrees is contained the fullness of mercy and is an unquestionable proof of love for me. By this means the soul glorifies and pays reverence to my mercy. By means of this image, I shall grant many graces to souls. It is to be a reminder of the demands of my mercy because even the strongest faith is of no avail without works. Okay, what about the plenary indulgence? In a decree dated August 3, 2002, the Apostolic Penitentiary announced that, quote, the plenary indulgence is granted under the usual conditions, that sacramental confession, Eucharistic communion, prayers for intention of the Supreme Pontiff, to the faithful on Divine Mercy Sunday in any church or chapel in a spirit that is completely detached from any affection for a sin, even a venial sin, take part in the prayers and devotions held in honor of Divine Mercy, or who... In the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, expose or reserve in the tabernacle, recite the Our Father in the Creed, adding a devout prayer to the merciful Lord Jesus. For example, merciful Jesus, I trust in you. Okay, now we've heard all that before, but it's good to be reminded of the significance of this great feast. <clears throat> now, as everyone knows, today in Rome, Pope Francis canonized Pope St. John the Twenty-Third and Pope St. John Paul II. On this occasion, we'll take a few minutes to hear an absolutely amazing story, which I lifted from the website 
of the Sons of the Most Holy Redeemer. They're the Transalpine Redemptorists with my usual editing, cutting, and pasting. If you have the time, uh, it's really worth looking at the website because they have a, a video of, of this uh, associated with this story. It's one of the few websites I can recommend with a good conscience. Okay. 1962, Sister Katerina Capitani. She's an 18-year-old novice from a nursing order called the Congregation of the Daughters of Charity in Naples. She started to feel a constant pain between her stomach and heart, which she ignored. Then one night, she felt like vomiting. She ran to the sink and found her mouth full of very red blood. Since they taught her in nursing school that that very red blood came from the chest area, she thought she had contracted tuberculosis. With a sickness like that, her life in the convent was finished. Sister Katerina explains, quote, The rule of our congregation is for all aspiring religious to be healthy in order to face the sacrifices and work that a hospital requires. If a nun is ill, she is sent home before pronouncing her vows. I had not yet pronounced my vows. So if my superiors had discovered I was ill with TB, they would have been obliged to send me home. Close quote. She decided not to say anything to anyone. Nothing happened for seven months. Then suddenly, with no warning symptoms, there was another terrible hemorrhage. This time the situation couldn't be hidden. Her superiors did not send her away. They tried to help her. There were doctor's visits, clinical examinations, checkups. The most celebrated specialists in Naples were consulted on the case, but no one succeeded in finding the reasons for the hemorrhages. For the next few years, she was passed from hospital to hospital, from specialist to specialist, until she finally saw Professor Giuseppe Zanini of the University of Naples, who at that time was an important international personality in the field of medicine. The professor decided to operate. The operation lasted for five hours. The inside of her stomach was completely covered with a strange and rare form of ulcerous tumor. The professor removed her stomach except for a small piece the size of a prune. The esophagus was connected directly to the intestine. He also removed her pancreas and her spleen. It was a delicate operation, and the probabilities for the patient to come out of the operating room alive were quite slim. Before the operation, Sister Katerina tells us, quote, I had prayed to the Holy Virgin of Pompeii, to whom I am very devoted. The day after the operation, while I was thanking the Virgin for having come through the operation safely, a sister from our congregation told me, it was Pope John XXIII who saved you. I played his image on the bed of the operating room and continued to pray throughout the operation. She gave me the Pope's image and told me to place myself under his protection. I admired John XXIII very much, but had never thought of praying to him. I answered, thank you for what you have done for me. But I'm convinced it was the Holy Virgin of Pompeii who protected me, and I will continue to pray to her. I placed the image of Pope John on the nightstand as if it served no purpose for me. Close quote. In the days following the surgery, Sister Katrina's health continued to worsen. The sisters continued to pray to Pope John, and Sister Katerina continued to pray the Holy Virgin of Pompeii. Twelve days after the operation, she went into another crisis. Sister Katerina, quote, my sisters repeated to me, you have to pray to Pope John. I was convinced and began to pray to the good Pope. Ten days later, I was able to leave the clinic. Close quote. The improvement was once again short-lived. Sister Katerina began to vomit great quantities of gastric fluids, which were so acidic that they burned her skin. The lower part of her face was a complete sore. She had to be fed intravenously, since she couldn't hold anything down in her stomach. Professor Zanini was still very worried, decided to send her home, hoping that perhaps a change in atmosphere going to her hometown would help her. Two months later, Sister Katerina returned to Naples in worse condition than when she had left. She looked as if she were already dead. Sister Katerina, quote, On May 14, 1966, following a serious crisis of vomiting, I felt my abdomen and it was completely wet. I called the sister to have a look at it. Gastric fluids, blood, and that little amount of orange juice that I had just drunk were flowing out of a hole that had opened on my abdomen. A doctor was called. He said there was a perforation which had caused this external hole. It's called an external fistula. I had peritonitis and a very high fever. The situation was desperate. Surgical intervention under those conditions was unthinkable. We daughters of charity pronounce our vows five years after having donned the habit. The rule provides for exceptions, however, when a young sister is about to die. This was my case. So on 19th of May, 1966, I pronounced my vows and was immediately administered extreme unction. 
On the 22nd of May, a sister brought me a relic of Pope John's from Rome, a piece of the sheet upon which the Pope had died. I placed it on the perforation which had opened on my stomach, and since I was suffering quite a bit, I prayed to the Pope to take me to heaven. I was slowly dying. I felt that my strength was leaving me. My temperature was very high. A sister guarded the room day and night. On May 25th, around 2.30 in the afternoon, I asked a sister who was guarding the room to close the window a little because the light bothered me. She did so and then left the room for a few minutes. I drifted off to sleep. At a certain point, I felt a hand pressing the wound on my stomach and the voice of a man saying, Sister Katerina, Sister Katerina. I thought it was Professor Zanini who had come to check on me occasionally. I turned to the voice and saw Pope John. He was standing beside my bed. He had the same smile as the image that had been given me. He was holding his hand on my wound. You prayed to me very much, he said with a calm voice. Many people have prayed to me, but especially one. You have really taken this miracle from my heart. But don't be afraid now. You're healed. Ring the bell. Call the sisters who are in chapel. Have them take your temperature, and you'll see that you will not have even the slightest temperature. Eat whatever you want, as you did before the sickness. I will hold my hand on your wound, and you'll be healed. Go to the professor. Have him examine you. Have some x-rays done, and have it all written down, because these things will be needed someday. The vision disappeared, and only then did I begin to realize what had happened. I wondered whether it had been a dream. I was trembling from the emotion and fear. I felt well, I felt no pain, but didn't dare call it sisters. They would have thought I was crazy. After several minutes, I had to decide. I did what the Pope had told me. I rang the bell. The sisters hurried to my bedside and found me sitting up on the bed. They looked at me as if they were dreaming. I could no longer stifle my joy, and I almost shouted, I have been healed. It was Pope John. Measure my fever. You'll see that I have none. Mother Superior thought I was delirious, as sometimes happens before death. They took my temperature, 98.2. Do you see, I said, challenging them? Now give me something to eat, because I'm hungry. I hadn't been able to hold anything down in my stomach for many months. Mother Superior, who was almost hypnotized by my state of excitement, ordered the sisters to do as I asked. A sister brought me some cream of wheat, which I ate voraciously, to the astonishment of my sisters. Then they brought me an ice cream, and I ate that too. I'm still hungry, I said. The sister brought me some meatballs, and I ate those, followed by some soup, and I devoured that as well. At this point, the mother superior, who was still not convinced of what was happening, said, Now we have to change you, thinking that everything I had eaten had gone out the opening on my stomach, which is what has always happened. They lay me down on the bed. A nurse brought gauze and a clean nightgown, then covered me. The nurse shouted, but there's nothing here. The sisters fell on their knees, crying from emotion. Until a few minutes earlier, the skin on my stomach had been one big wound. The gastric fluids that had constantly flowed out of the opening had corroded the skin. The wound had completely disappeared. There was no sign of the opening, not a trace. The skin was smooth, clean, and white. So I told them what had happened. From that day on, I haven't been ill at all. The doctors examined me, did scores of x-rays. There wasn't a trace of my illness. The day after the miracle, I went back to a normal life. My first lunch was French fries, roast kid, tomatoes, and ice cream. I went back to eating anything I wanted. That was decades ago. I'm well, have no problems with digestion, and work with enthusiasm. Close quotes, Sister Katerina. Now, she was cured on May 25, 1966, when she's 22. More than 30 years later, Sister flashed a smile and said, Quote, I always feel like I'm in perfect health. Except for a cold now and then, I have no other problems with my health. The doctors in the various hospitals where I've worked over the years after the miracle, being aware of my physical condition, have always been prepared for the final collapse. But until now, it hasn't come. I must say that I hold back nothing. We sisters of the congregation of the Daughters of Charity always have to be available to help the sick at any time, and I believe very much in my vocation. Close quote. Okay, now this was, although it was an instantaneous miracle, it wasn't just an instantaneous miracle in the sense it was over within the blink of time. Until her death on the night of March 31st, 2010, her condition was an ongoing, continuous miracle. Sister had a stomach the size of a prune, no spleen, no pancreas. According to doctors, this emergency situation could not last, and she should have lived an extremely prudent life, stay rested, and been on a rigorous diet. But for nearly 44 years after this miraculous healing, Sister was a human cyclone. She worked 
as a nursing sister in a hospital of over 300 beds with a working day that usually went from 5.30 in the morning till midnight or sometimes 1 a.m. at a pace that was absolutely unexplainable given her physical condition. We'll close with some reflections by Father Michael Mary. The fact that Pope St. John XXIII has worked this miracle proves that he is in heaven and that he was a true pope. In the matter of the papacy, the omniscient God provided a living affirmation that the true church continues through the popes that followed Pope Pius XII. The church may not be the way we think it should be, but it is the church. The popes may not be the way that we think they should be either, but they are the popes. After Pope Pius XII, there came Pope St. John XXIII. If we doubt this, we should meditate on the miracle of Sister Caterina Capitani. But if we deny the miracle, we would be like those of old, of whom our Lord said, I speak to you, and you believe not. The works that I do in the name of my Father, they give testimony of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. Persevere along the narrow, often painful road of life in the church under Peter in 2014. The truth is often difficult to accept. There are many times when we like to say, stop the world, I want to get off. But that is not an option. However bad it is, we must accept it. The spiritual world is as real as the material world. Escaping the church is not a real option. It would be leaving the spiritual, invisible reality upon which our eternity depends for a temporal, deadly game of playing house. The fact, the fact that Pope St. John the Twenty Third has worked this miracle proves that he's in heaven and that he was a true pope. The church may not be the way we think it should be, but it is the church. The popes may not be the way we think they should be either, but they are the popes. <laughs>